Good morning. I'm Doug Fico. I, mean, I know many of you out there. For those of you that don't know, well, you're the lucky ones. <laughs> so I'll be reading Hebrews this morning, chapters 11, verses 1 through 7, then dropping down to verses 29 through 40. If you want to read along, I'm reading the New International Version after uh, verses 29 through 40, chapters 12, 1 through 3. So, faith in action. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is, this is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that, his re that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things, that, things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in the deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. They were all condemned for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Well, we have had a couple of longer passages in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and leading up to our scripture for today, I think we've had some passages that were fairly dense. They had a lot of theological thought that were packed into a small, well, small space, but then they would sometimes be even long passages, and it was a little bit hard. But I, the change of tone that we get when we get to chapter 11 in Hebrews is pretty welcome. Now it's a bit more narrative, talking about this these people of faith who have come before us, and I think it's, it's, we're welcoming this change of tone. Uh, there's this introductory remark that's there. He says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance for what we do not see. 
This is what the ancients were commended for. And then he goes through to walk us through these brief stories of the life of people of faith throughout the Old Testament. And people who are familiar with the Old Testament would know a bunch of these stories. And he's taken their lives and, and kind of reduced them down, has s- distilled them down into just one sentence or two about their life. And so we um, get just a brief, brief summary about what they did or said. And there's this phrase that is repeated, and we, we skipped some of the verses in there about different people. You can go back and read about some of those people afterwards, uh, but the phrase that's repeated is, by faith. By faith, these people did this or that. By faith. And some of those things, by faith, seem kind of small. So, by faith, Jacob blessed his sons. Seems like kind of a small thing. Then it'll say just afterwards, it says, by faith, the people passed through the sea on dry land because God had separated the sea. So those things are really big. And I think even if it's your first time reading this passage, I think you will intuitively understand that what the, the, the preacher here, the writer of this book is trying to do is he's trying to encourage people, all of us, to live in the same way, to be people who live by faith. And to be people who do that, whatever that is, what that means, doing by faith, to do that in whatever circumstances we may find ourselves in. We need to live a life of faith. Well, we're going to figure out what that means. So this morning we're going to talk, first of all, we need to define what does that mean to live a life of faith. Then we're going to find out what it means to encourage us to live a life of faith. And then we're going to have a few practical steps for us in a life of faith. We're going to define the life of faith, encourage, how do we encourage a life of faith, and then talk about some practical steps in this life of faith. Well, I drive a 1998 green Honda Civic. Fading paint, it's all coming off. Beautiful, as you expect. It is all the glory that you would think it would be. But yeah, turn some heads, I'm not going to deny. Uh, but I, the other day, I drove uh, in that car to uh, Porter Ranch to go get a cup of coffee over at, uh, over at Pete's over there. And you could say, Kurt, that was an act of faith. You know, it's, it's uphill to go there, right? <laughs> it's an act of faith. You know, and I just, I just want to go ahead. And, and you don't normally like to call people out. But, you know, John Marthens saw my car, and, and he... He kind of wants it, and I, there's a, it's, it's wrong to covet other people's stuff. So if you, are, if you are friends with John, I want you to speak into his life and help him. to The coveting, yeah, there are other cars out there, brother. You can go find them. So, <laughs> By faith, by faith, that's where I was, right, by faith. So when we read through this list of people in, in the, the whole list in Hebrews 11, by faith, these people, you think, gosh, I'm... I, one of the things we can think about ourselves is, you know, I'm, I'm not a faith hero like Kurt driving to Porter Ranch or like Mike Moses. They're, I mean, they're similar, right? So I don't have that kind of faith. And maybe you think to yourself, you know, listen, I'm not the kind of person who is in the Bible whose faith gets written about later. And, and, and you can say, well, of course those people have big faith because they're the people who ended up getting written about. Uh, writer Donald Guthrie, he writes this. He says, we may see ourselves by contrast as much too normal or worldly or powerless to live extraordinary lives of faith. You say, you know, that's, that's not me. I can't be like that. But if we say that, then we're actually missing the whole point of what the writer of Hebrews is trying to get at. The, the writer is writing to regular Christians and saying, yes, these are the people who went before us in faith, and I know that you're regular Christians like me, but we should also live lives of faith. He's writing to ordinary people. He knew they were ordinary people, but he says that this is something that we can aspire to, to press toward. Because I think a life of faith is meant to be normal for a normal Christian. It will be people who live our life of faith in our daily walk all the time. There are a couple of ideas about faith that we have kind of inherited from our world around us that have not been very helpful for us as we approach this question and think about being people of faith. And there's misconceptions, and they're misconceptions that both religious people have and people who don't have a faith that we 
both bring to this. So it isn't specific to one group or another. And last week I did talk about a couple of false ways that we can view faith, and I kind of want to add a couple more. The first one is that we misunderstand faith if we see faith as being primarily a blind leap. If faith is this, this, this jump that you take that you don't know what's afterwards. And a lot of people... If we understand it in that way, they will oppose or put in opposition faith and science. They say, listen, I, I'm not a person of faith. I believe in science. Uh, and so if we think that faith is a blind leap, we will con- consciously or unconsciously put those two in opposition. I will tell you, I believe in science too. Uh, the, those don't have to be fundamentally in conflict. In fact, some, some, uh, it's true that there are people who undermine thoughts about science today, but Sometimes you will read that back into history and uh, add a false thought to th- even think that maybe, for example, that the Renaissance was a bringing out of the Dark Ages, that people now were able to have some new light and that, that it was escaping, pulling science and learning out of the grasp of the church. Uh, but that's revisionist, really. Actually, the, the church, there were a lot of the ancient texts about Greek literature and about learning were protected and advanced by monks living in, uh, in monasteries across Europe. That really, it was the monasteries that protected all of those documents that we still have. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have a lot of Greek documents about uh, classic thoughts and philosophers if, if not for them. Uh, so it's, it's not, we sometimes read back into those things, this opposition between uh, learning and faith. Uh, the second misconception that we can have today, and a lot of people have when they think about a life of faith, is we think that a life of faith is synonymous with kind of um, deep reflection, kind of uh, like great spiritual people who uh, are so uh, into this thing, this person of deep faith. So that could be somebody like Buddha, that could be somebody like Krishna, somebody like Christ. Uh, so this is, what well, it isn't, When we think about this, it's not really so much what they believe, but we think about the depth of their belief, that it's somebody who really has this deep, moving faith. So we don't think that it matters really what they say or think, but as long as they are completely sincere and that there's, it's really uh, 100% all the way, that they're really deep into that. So it's, I I think in general, we think that that kind of uh, belief should it's not just for any belief. We would prefer that it be the kind of belief that makes you kinder in some way, which is a good thing. We, we want that. Um, but it, it's, it's a faith that I think oftentimes feels very foreign to us. We think that, that well, that's, I'm glad that there's people like that in the world, but that's not my style. I don't need to be like that. That is not what the writer of the book of Hebrews wants for us. That's not the image we get here. It's not this blind faith as a leap kind of faith. Uh, or it's also not just this mystical kind of deep reflective faith. So what kind of faith is he talking about? It's not just brainless. It's not just emotion. Well, it's when we look at the people's lives in this passage, let's just define it by when we look what we see in them. And what I see in them is people who are taking confident action. They are action-oriented. By faith, Abel brought. By faith, Noah built. By faith, Isaac blessed. By faith, Rahab welcomed. Each time, there's an action word that's there, that what they did. They did something. And I think your faith, our faith, yours, mine, it needs to have some aspect of action built into it. It needs to be, whatever we think, it needs to get translated into real-world actions, something that we do. Uh, I had a leader who told me once, uh, he said, um, it it doesn't matter if you believe something strongly. He uh, he would use this image many times. He says, for example, faith, to show you, is if you have it, you could have a chair next to you, and you could say, I believe that chair is strong enough to hold me up. That, That looks like a good chair. I like that chair. But faith is simply sitting down. That we demonstrate our faith by acting on it. Real faith is taking action. It's the action of sitting down, not saying what we think about it. So I think by faith, you worship on Sunday. Uh, By faith, we forgive someone else. By faith, we can be generous. By faith, we can be patient. By faith, you can say someone, by faith, he talked with his coworker about Christ. Uh, By faith, she invited a friend to come to the tea. 
And so it's not a blind leap. I don't think that there's an aspect in those that says, oh, I I didn't know at all what to expect. Uh, But there's an act that's based on a connection with other people and based on some of what we know about God already, what we know about who God is. That gives us a basis for taking some of those actions. I, I know this chair is solid because I've had some experience with it. And I've had some experience with God. I've walked some of this road with God. So it's not just sentimental. It is demonstrating courage in our faith. Well, and I said that it's confident action. And I think about that word confident. When I look at that list of people of faith, each time that there was a step forward, I, I, the one thing I thought about is I actually, I say that it's confident, but I have no idea what these people were feeling on the inside. I, that really struck me this time as I read through this passage. I was imagining each time the circumstances that these people were in, and they must have just thought, well, what am I going to do? And then they did something, and they had huge obstacles before them. I, just think about Moses' mother. The, they're, they said that they are killing babies of a certain age, and she's got her baby. What am I going to do? I, I can think of her prayers. Lord, what can I do? And and in some way, in some desperation, even as she sets this child adrift on the Nile, uh, I I just think she kind of did what she could in the end. Probably, If you were to ask her, I kind of wonder if she would just say, I I didn't know how this was going to turn out. I just did what I could. But to us, it looked like confident action that she says, I trust God with my baby. And maybe that's what it's going to look like for us, too. We are not always going to know how everything's going to turn out. I, I think of Abraham. He, he was sent from where he had lived before and goes into the promised land. And I think he's, he had to ask himself the question sometimes, did I really hear God? I mean, he, God told him to do this thing, and he can go, is that really, was that really what it was? I, we don't always know what's next. I, I know students who, because of a growing faith in Christ, they ended up deciding to break up with their significant other. And uh, it was a decision specifically to be better for their life because that person was dragging them down in some way, wasn't contributing to their faith. And they said, I don't think they knew what was the next step. That feels, that, they did that by faith. They took action, though, on what they did know. There was some knowledge that was there. So God, I think, is calling us into, s- take steps into places where we might be in over our heads. Or maybe the situation that we're going into is a little more chaotic than makes us feel comfortable. Maybe it's a place where we risk being rejected or underappreciated or just maybe sidelined in some way. And you know what we call that when we take steps into those spaces in our normal life? We don't normally call that faith in our world today. We don't normally call that faith. We just call that courageous living. Hey, hey, this is a person who, you, when you start a new job, you have no idea how that's going to turn out. You start a new relationship, you don't know exactly where that's going to go, but you take a chance and you, are, you live courageously. And we as Christians, we live courageously, but we have some knowledge of what God is like. So we have courageous living in the light of Christ. I think that's a great definition of what it looks like to be people of faith. To be Christians is to have this courageous living in the light of Christ. So what God is calling for us to do is to just kind of be ordinary, everyday heroes of faith. To, to live courageously in the light of Christ, what he did, who he is. So that means that faith isn't meant to be uncommon. It's not supposed to be just, uh, you know, a few highlights here and there, but it's supposed to be something that is part of the normal, everyday Christian life. And I think, and usually, I think it's mostly going to be pretty unmemorable stuff. I think it's going to be that you're the first person to apologize. I think it's going to be choosing to be faithful to your spouse. I think it's helping out a single mom who's in trouble, (laughs) making sure your elderly parent is cared for, maybe even inviting your neighbor to church or something like that. And it's, it's courageous. You're just opening yourself up to what the faith life could be each week, each moment, to say, you know, I, I think sometimes being fa- faithful, a faithful act could just be showing up. I think a lot of our faith life can be showing up. By faith, he showed up. 
That, that, is, that would make the new, I, I wonder, you know, we think about all these great acts of faith. What, we can ask ourselves, what makes God's news every day? There, there's a lot of news that we follow, uh, all the things that get uh, talked about, uh, new uh, politics or, or actors or whatever, things that make the news. I wonder what makes the news for God. And it could be sometimes very small things. Wow. He showed up. She forgave. These are things that can be noteworthy to God and end up, I think, also changing the trajectory of our lives. That we end up choosing again and again toward faith instead of away from it. In the end, we're creating a faithful life, courageously living in the light of Christ. So I wonder what we need to take action on. There's things that God might be calling us to do that, to, to take the next right step for you and me of faithfulness. All right, that's, that's defining the life of faith. It's courageously living in the light of Christ. Well, what does it mean for us to encourage the life of faith? Well, in the beginning of chapter 12, the, the author looks back over this list of names that we've gone through, and, and he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw everything off that hi- and, and, and throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. When I thought about this cloud of witnesses in the past, I thought primarily of people who are watching me, maybe witnessing what I'm doing. Uh, I'm not sure if I ever heard a sp- sermon specifically say that thing, but I, I got to tell you, that's kind of the image that I came away with, was that there were a bunch of people kind of watching me. I, so you can maybe think I'm paranoid or whatever. I, that's just the way I thought about it. And so there's this image of them, people watching me on my faith run. So our faith is compared to going on a run, to, to run in a specific direction. And I, and I thought about these people maybe judging me for how I'm doing. And, and I think there are a couple of reasons for that. If we're honest, I think we can acknowledge that, that we're kind of judgmental people in general. Uh, we assume in general that people are judging us. Uh, when I thought of a sporting match, it's kind of the image that's given here. Uh, I think about myself at a sporting match. People yell at the players. You yell at the umpire, you think, oh, you know, if I were umping this game, that would not have been a strike, okay? If I were the athlete in this game, I totally would have seen that guy coming, all right? All right. So we think, we assume, we, we know that we are able to look at the circumstances and assume that we would do a little bit better. So when we hear about a cloud of people witnessing us running, I think about ourselves as a crowd and kind of booing them or something, I don't know, like shaking our heads in disappointment or something like that. Um, I, I feel like with... All the things with the internet, most of, the, most of our lives have been a little dulled by some things. The one thing that has been sharpened is our ability to mock other people, I think. So we've gotten really good at that. And, and, and we, our words can be very painful. And I think that it also cuts into, it makes us a little less courageous if we're worried what somebody else is going to think about what we're doing. Uh, it it's, makes us less courageous, not just in spiritual things, I think in other things as well. It erodes those things. And it erodes faith. If, if we say that that is courageous living, if courageous living is what faith looks like, it makes us a little less courageous. The second thing that makes us, as we look at this, uh, that we, as we think about this cloud of witnesses, is that we tend, as we understand this, we tend to think about this image in a very self-centered way. And part of that is just the fact that we are Americans in the 21st century, and we, we view the world through our, our normal lens as Americans uh, through radical individualism. We think primarily about the individual, and that's just the way that, that we think that, uh, not only is it the way that we see the world, we think the whole world sees it that way. We think that's the way that people have seen it throughout history. That is not the case. That is not the way that a lot of the world sees it. It's not the way it has always been. Uh, and if we l- come to the Bible and think it is as individualistic as we are, we are mistaken. It is not as me-centered as we tend to be. So when I approach this passage, I tend to think, oh, this is, a, this is about me, right? It's about people cheering for me. That's, that's not the automatic assumption we need to have. We have to remember throughout the vast majority of history and uh, the most of the rest of the world outside the West, most people tend to view things a bit more communally, that they say, what is this, let's think about this together. It's the, it's the default position. Even a lot of the places in Scripture, uh, when you read you, we tend to think 
it's talking about me, but it's, it tends to be, actually the word is more of a y'all, kind of an all y'all. That's just the way that it is. It's more communal than we tend to. So I think we need to look at this passage with some fresh eyes to take off our individualistic view, to take off the view that these people are looking at us and judging us. So what are they doing? Well, it says they are witnesses. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And I wonder, what do you think that they are witnessing? The word witness, is the same meaning is actually someone who testifies. They are somebody who has something to testify about. They have something to say. They are not there as witnesses to witness what you are doing. This is not a jury of people who are watching you to judge you and say if you did it right or not. These are regular people who probably considered themselves ordinary at the time but who lived a life of faith, and they are willing by their lives to tell you a story about the faithfulness of God in everyday circumstances. And that is what they are testifying to. This group, this cloud of witnesses, is here to testify about the character of God. They're not there to testify about you. They're testifying about God and what God did in their lives. And how, how you and I, we can trust God today because God did that for me in the past. I think that you should trust God today. You should believe in him, believe in his promises. You can take bold steps because God was there. You can trust him. He's faithful. They're testifying of the, the value of being faithful even in difficulty. And, and they are there to witness whether or not you are able to kind of pull it off. They are not there to, to groan if you fall. They are there to cheer you on. I remember a moment in college. I was at a swim meet, and I saw there was a swimmer who had just swam the best race of his life. And when he, he finished, looked up at the time, was kind of blown away at the time, and he leapt out of the water and started yelling. And one of his teammates was coming up for the next heat, and he just started yelling at the other guy, you can do this. Oh, my gosh, look what I just did. Oh, my gosh, you can do this. You've got this. Come on, come on. And I think that that's the image that we have here, like somebody who has just finished their race, who's now turning to the next person who's going to run or swim and say, you can do this. They're testifying to what is possible to cheer them on and get somebody else pumped up for their race. They want to get us excited for our race. Uh, to use a little, a little more contemporary example, maybe something that's a little more normal now, I think, you know what this is? I think this is like a Google review. <laughs> like an Amazon review, right? You, you go to buy something or you want to use a service and you go, you know, I'm not really sure if these people are really trustworthy. I've never heard of this place before. I'm not really sure. And it, but if, I don't know if you ever do that. You check and see what the ratings are. You're like, how many of these are bots? How many of these have been bought? You know, you're like, I'm always really like, can't be five stars all the way across. It has to be a little bit less, right? Four and a, qu- four and a half is better. It's okay, right? And, and I think this cloud of witness is they're saying, hey, this place has delivered in the past. And, and so we as people of faith, we could be asking this question, hey, is faith worth it? Is this faith thing a scam? Am I going to get, is, is God trustworthy? And, and, I, and I just kind of thought about the reviews that they might have. Right, Noah, there was a big initial investment, but in the end it was a safe bet. Ten out of ten would have faith in God again. <laughs> Rahab, this was my first transaction with the God of Israel, but he delivered as promised. Okay. So the, this cloud of witnesses that's there it is telling us it is worthwhile for us to follow in God. You can put your trust in him. So you and I, they are cheering us on. They're not judging us. They're cheering us on in our life of faith. Because the truth is, sometimes it's going to be really hard. And what I appreciate about this list in the life of faith is it's not everybody, not everybody has turned out great. They say, so, sometimes, so, I, I was really struck by this, sometimes people believed and they were conquered places. Sometimes people believed and they were cut in two. Sometimes the dead were given back to them and sometimes there was great failure. So for us in our life of faith, we can't judge it just by how things are turning out because we, we naturally want to have it go our way or make it easy. But we've got this list of people cheering us on. They go, you know what, you are faithful 
And it's okay if it doesn't turn out as rosy as what everybody else wants it to be. And that might be your case. You maybe have made some decisions to follow God that have been faithful, that have cost you. He says, stick with it. That doesn't mean that it's not right. They're cheering you on. And I think we probably need it more when things are really hard. And remember, these are, these are believers who are going through persecution, difficulty. And they want to encourage us in our life of faith. We see the cost a lot, that they're testifying to the faithfulness of God. And I, and I think, I, you know, it's not just the people who are in the Bible who are part of our cloud of faith. You probably have had other people who have invested in you, in your life. The people who encourage you to take steps of faith. Uh, maybe a, a youth worker or your parent or a grandparent. There have been friends who have encouraged us. Remember earlier he says, he says encourage one another. Don't give up. Like, we need to find ways to help each other to go on the walk of faith. There, I hope that together we can even be part of the cloud of witnesses to each other. You can be that person to someone else. I wonder who you are the cloud of witnesses to. You can define life of faith as courageous living in the light of faith and, and encourage other people to live a life of faith, even if it costs them a lot. Okay, briefly, last thing. So some practical steps in our life of faith. Um, there are three of them that stand out really clearly from uh, chapter 12 here in Hebrews. He says, so because we are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So there's stuff that we need to throw off it says, picturing this runner who's going, you need to, we need to drop things that are hindering us from what we need to do. Uh, the, the list of people that we have in chapter 11, they are not perfect people. They had plenty of issues, a lot of problems. Uh, and, but as they went through it all, they are given still as a, as a list of faithful people with issues. You know, it, that, that kind of is a good summary of CME Covenant Church. A list of faithful people with issues. Amen. Praise the Lord. We can close now. <laughs> that is good news for me, good news for you. Uh, but these things are, the, these encumbrances are pro things that slow us down in our race. These can be patterns of sin that cause us to slow down in our race. Patterns of broken down thoughts, patterns of toxic habits that have been passed down to us, maybe even through generational problems. It could be fear that we have of other people and what they're thinking of us. It can be our own distraction. Sometimes I'll pick on myself, my own laziness sometimes. I just think we have to throw those things off so that we can run well. It's like wearing too many clothes and you're going to start a race. No, no, you don't need that stuff for your race. This is getting in your way. Let's not have that be in your way anymore. And, and we need each other to help grow in that area. And I think it's helpful for us to say that's going to be a lifetime thing. We have to continue to, uh, to go in the right direction. We also need to not just take our, for our encumbrances, but we need to run the race set out for us with perseverance. We, we need to engage today, and we're going to have to stick with it. It's not going to be done in a day. We're not going to get there right away. It's going to take a while. And, and I really am struck by this phrase, the race marked out for us. That's not the same as the race marked out for the person sitting next to you. It's not the same as the race marked out for the generation before us. That we have a different race that is marked out for us. And we are facing different things today. Things that are in your life today that weren't here a couple years ago. Things that will be different in five years. That we have to run the race that is here before us. I, I, I wonder what it means for us to live faithful lives in a, in a world that has increasingly divisive politics. What does it mean for us to be faithful people who care about what Jesus wants, who are engaged with our world, but also in a place that it's just getting more and more toxic? Can we be people who are not as toxic? Uh, what does it mean for us to, in a broader sense, even just tribalism in general, in a really global world, we, it just gets smaller and smaller. We stick with just the little people who agree with us in general. I think that Christians are called in some ways to cross over those Barriers. The, the Christian community in the first century was one of the most diverse possible. Uh, 
socioeconomically, uh, of different uh, races, people, backgrounds. Uh, I wonder what it means for us to run that thing that's set out before us. What is right before us? And I can't promise that that faith is going to be easy. Whatever it is, I think your faith thing, maybe you just got something dropped in your lap. You said, I didn't know this was going to be a part of the race. That we're supposed to run with perseverance the race set out before us. And we're not doing it alone. We've got a cloud of witnesses cheering for us. And I hope that we have also a a church of people encouraging us to do that as well. But you can be faithful in any circumstance. But we know also from this list of people that you're not going to be able to control all the outcome. It's hard, but you can persevere, whether feeling victorious or feeling it's difficult because we know that God is good. And the last thing we have is that we're supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. He wasn't just someone who is a part of our cloud of witnesses. He's not just somebody who lived a faithful life. He's the author and perfecter of faith. This And he is somebody who, of all people, experienced great difficulty and trial, even though he was faithful and pure. He experienced rejection from people, and he was willing to die on our behalf on the cross. And we're supposed to fix our eyes on him. And I love, even in the picture, if we're thinking of this crowd of people cheering for us, he's not just cheering for us from the crowd. Where is he? We're fixing our eyes on him. That means that we are running toward him. That he's looking at us going, yes, come to me. Run toward me. I'm the one who, uh, he's the one who paved the way for us. He's already crossed the finish line. He says, come to me. I want you with me. This is what faith looks like. He is the image of faith and not just the image of faith. He is the pioneer and perfecter of faith. So we should consider him who endured such difficulty and not grow weary, not lose heart. Because faith we can't give up on our faith. It's gonna, there are going to be some very small things that God's going to call us to in faithfulness in the days ahead. Maybe there are going to be some other things that are going to feel like you are, they're costing you everything. But God says it is worth it. It is worth it to continue with God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this image of the people who have gone before us in this journey of faith. And I pray that we together will hear the voices of people who have gone before us who say, stick with Christ. That we can hear the people around us too that say, I know that thing is hard, but you stay with him. Can, can that move us, Lord? We pray that you will move us to be people who can take a step of faith, whether it's small or big, to be faithful today, to be faithful this week, to be faithful this month, to stick with you because you're the God who is so good. Even when things are difficult, life with you is the right life. You are the author and perfecter of that faith, and you're going to give us true life. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.